Uh, I'm at the Texas Tech University. I'm a Gordon Tullock professor in the Free Market Institute and professor of political science in, in the College of Arts and Sciences. So let's go ahead and let's get right to it. Let's start talking about the 2021 Nobel Prize in Economics. So here are the winners. Uh, doesn't look so great for Econ 3 white dudes, but that's kind of the way it goes in Econ for, for prizes. Two women have won the Nobel Prize. Uh, uh, Eleanor Ostrom and uh, also in 2019, uh, Esther Duflo won the Nobel Prize as well, but it's, it's, it is what it is. So anyway, these guys are extremely distinguished economists, Josh Angriest, David Card, and Guido Imbens. Uh, Josh is 61, PhD from Princeton, professor at MIT. David, a little bit older, also Princeton. Guido, a little bit younger. And the Nobel Committee is sort of interesting. Usually the prizes are shared equally among all the recipients, but they gave half the prize to Card and 25% and 25% to Imbens and Angrist. So it's about 1.2 million US dollars. So it's even getting one fourth of it is, is not too shabby. And just sort of a fun fact, uh, Angrist and, and Carr sort of from the same genealogy. They had the same dissertation advisor, a gentleman named Orly Ashenfelter. So these are super eminent economists. Before we get into what they want it for, let's just talk a little bit about them. So this is Google Scholar for Josh Angrist. As you can see, he's been cited almost 82,000 times. He has an H index of 84 and each index says, how many articles do you have with how many sites? So he has 84 articles that at least have 84 sites. You can see his largest highest cited article there has almost 20,000 citations on its own. That's pretty good, right? That's a pretty good, uh, a pretty good body of work. Dave Card, around 80,000 again, H index even higher. Uh, doesn't have a, a 10,000 site article, but has just tons of highly cited articles. And finally, Guido Mbenz, 75,000. He's kind of the, the younger of these guys. He's a little bit behind them, but you can see that his citation count is climbing and he will catch up pretty soon. So these are like highly cited eminent economists, highly deserving of the prize and just sort of top rank people. But it's not just getting cited that gets you a Nobel Prize in economics. I can think of other really highly cited economists Robert Biro has more sites than these guys. Andre Schleifer has over 100,000 citations. Everybody's favorite uh, macroeconomist, Larry Summers, has citations along the lines of these guys. But these guys did something special, and that's what they're being uh, rewarded for with the Nobel Prize. So let's take a quick look at what the Swedish Academy said about them. This year's laureates have provided us with new insights and shown what conclusions about cause and effect can be drawn from natural experiments. Their approach is spread to other fields and revolutionized empirical research. So those are the two things I wanna talk about. You know, how do we try to figure out causality and how do natural experiments help us do that? Why is it hard to figure out causality and how do natural experiments help us do that? That's the part of this that I really wanna focus on. So in other words, you know, they won for pioneering natural experiments, and we call that causal inference. So this is a prize for what I teach, and it makes me happy. So I'm very happy to be here today talking to you guys about it. Okay. They, Swedes also say, giving an example, many of the big questions in social science deal with cause and effect. Yeah. How does immigration affect pay and employment? How does a longer education affect someone's future income? So these questions are hard to answer because you know, we don't necessarily have good comparisons, right? What I'd ideally like to know for someone who went to college, how did that affect their earnings? I'd like to know what would they have earned if they hadn't gone to college? And I never see that, right? I see people who went to college and what they earn. I see people that didn't go to college and what they earn. But, you know, I have to be really careful. We have to be really careful comparing, you know, the earnings of college graduates to non-college graduates and saying that any difference in those earnings are causal, right? That college is causing those earnings. And the reason why that is, is because of selection bias and because, you know, we need somehow to be able to compare the outcome for the same individual in both alternative futures. We can never do that. So we have to impute the missing part of that, right? I have to say, okay, this guy went to college, he earns this much money. What would he have earned if he hadn't gone to college? I have to come up with a number for that, right? And the obvious things that people in the media do in the newspapers, maybe college administrators do is they're just gonna take the non-college population and use that as the counterfactual or use that as the number of what would have happened to that person if they hadn't gone to college. And that's problematic, okay? 
So we have this kind of fundamental problem of causal inference that we can't see the same person or the same state or the same county getting the treatment, going to college and not getting the treatment at the same time. So we really are always trying to look for the missing half of that puzzle, right? We see people that didn't go to college. We might want to ask, what would they have earned if they had gone? And we don't see that. And we have to figure out how to impute that. So that's kind of the fundamental problem of causal inference. We don't see both sides of the comparison and we have to figure out a way to compute or impute or provide the missing part of that comparison in, in a way that's convincing and, and, and useful. So another way, simplified way to say all this that I'm saying here is to say it in the old expression, correlation is not causation. <laughs> we see something that's correlated. We, we wanna say something about causation. It's just not that simple. And this is kind of the problem that, that our Nobel laureates were thinking about and working on. So how do I know correlation isn't causation? Well, I can give an example, right? So looks like these cats weigh a thousand pounds each, right? They're doing heavy damage here and causing structural damage and road damage. But we know, right, that that's probably, those cats aren't causing that damage more than likely, okay? And and we have to be careful because a lot of more serious comparisons that we see made in the news media by pundits and by professional opinion havers aren't much more sophisticated than this. The cat is there, there's a hole, the cat caused the hole, okay? The issue that we have is called selection bias. We're trying to study the effect of some treatment. What's the effect of smoking on life expectancy or on earnings? What's the effect of college degree on life happiness or on earnings. But the assignment of the treatment, so who smokes, who goes to college, isn't random, right? It's very systematic. So treatment status is correlated often with the outcome we want to study, and that is what we mean by selection bias. And when we have selection bias, then these correlations are not reliable and they're not causal. Think about smoking, right? If I wanted to say, and there are advertisements, public service advertisements to say this, that smoking makes you poorer, right? That people who smoke earn less money. Well, the second statement is true, but it doesn't mean the first statement is true, right? It's definitely true if you just compare average incomes of regular smokers and non-smokers that the non-smokers earn more money. But it's a huge leap to say that a smoking is costing them the, the, the income, right? Because selection into treatment, who smokes, isn't random, right? Systematically, we know, unfortunately, that it's poor people, people in poor areas that tend to smoke more. And so, you know, smoking is negatively correlated with education. So people with less education and less socioeconomic status tend on average to be smokers. So, you know, just comparing earnings of smokers and non-smokers is really like a serious mistake, right? We can see the correlation between smoking and income, but it's not causal, right? It's this, right? And we don't want to go around saying stuff like this. Look at that cat that made that pothole. Right, smoking causes you to be poorer is the same thing. Same thing with college, right? It's not random who goes to college. There's systematic selection bias in who goes to college. People whose parents have gone to college, people who are richer, people who get better grades in high school, all tend to go to college as opposed to not going to college. So if we wanna look at earnings between college graduates and non-college, you know, we can't just compare those outcomes because those are systematically different populations. Right, non-college goers and college goers, we can't just make that comparison and say any difference in their earnings is due to the fact that the one group went to college. It's a lot more complicated than that. Okay. If we could assign treatment randomly, then we can solve selection bias and, and we can have correlations being causal. This is how drug trials work, right? We get a large number of subjects. We randomly assign one group to get the drug, another to get the placebo. We wait six months, three months, however long the, the, the protocols say to wait. And then we just compare the health outcomes among the people who got the treatment and the, versus the health outcomes of people who got the placebo. The difference between that is caused by the drug. Why is that okay, but not saying, you know, the difference in earning between smokers and non-smokers is caused by smoking? Because here in a drug trial, treatment is assigned randomly. So treatment status isn't correlated with anything else relating to health, right? It's completely random. So you can see, right, that, that that's a big plus, right? Random assignment allows us to make simple correlational comparisons and assume and be confident that they're causal. And economists do do this. 
right? We call them randomized control trials. And Banerjee, Duflo, and Michael Kramer won the 2019 Nobel Prize for doing these kind of randomized experiments in development economics. So economists do do this, right? We can often look and try to study the effect of certain kinds of treatments by explicitly randomizing the assignment. Right? It's usually what I would consider small stuff. Does adding an additional teacher improve test scores? Does giving meals in school increase attendance and performance? Now, those are important things, right? But there are a lot of other things we care about that we can't put into an RCT. Could you imagine parents if we, as the United States, decided we were going to randomly assign who gets to go to an Ivy League school? <laughs> Could you imagine the backlash that would happen from that, right? We can't do that. Could you imagine parents if we took 16-year-olds, God forbid, and randomly assigned one half of them to smoke? and the other half not to smoke, and then wait 20 years and look at their earnings, right? That would be a valid experiment, but we can't do it, right? And nor should we want to do it. I'm not trying to advocate that. But there are a lot of things that are really important that we really care about public policies that we cannot randomize, right? If we want to think about what's the effect of a country's exchange rate regime, do they fix their, their currency to the dollar? Or do they let it float? You know, we can't just compare outcomes on the fixed and the floaters because you know, selection into that exchange rate regime wasn't random. It has selection bias in there, and we're not allowed. The United Nations can't randomize you know, exchange rate regimes. If you think about, we want to know the difference between like a presidential system and a parliamentary system. Again, we can't randomize what kind of political regime a country has, so we're stuck with observational data, and we cannot use simple correlations because of selection bias. All right, so that is the problem that we're trying to solve. If we don't have random assignment, if we can't run an experiment, and we want to say something about causation, what can we do? Okay. And this is where Angus Card and Nimbins, where our laureates come in. They work on exactly this problem. How can we get information about causality when treatment status is not random, but rather people self-select into treatment? The answer they proposed was to study natural experiments. The key is to find situations where even though treatment may not be random, it's not correlated with the outcome that we're trying to study. Okay, so that's our problem. Our problem is there are tons of things we're interested in that we can't use randomized experiments. They're still really important. We still need to study them. We're not satisfied with correlational answers because of selection bias. So we need some way to use this non-experimental data, this observational data to get at causality. And Angus, Card, and Krubens, mostly Card was sort of the pioneer on natural experiments here. Angris and Emmons are a little bit more on statistical techniques. But his answer was to try to find things that occurred naturally or on their own that we can bring to bear on the problem we're trying to study, and we're confident that we're defe defeating selection bias. So that's kind of the intro of where we're at, sort of who these guys are, what they did to win, what the fundamental problem is, why it's a hard problem. So what I want to do now for the rest of the time that I'm, I'm going to talk to you guys before the overall Q&A is I want to try to give you a feel for what we mean by natural experiments, how they work, and what are some surprising findings that we've gotten from using natural experiments instead of just looking at, at, at correlations that have selection bias. So the first one I want to talk about is uh, the Oregon Medicaid access. Okay, And this work was done by two female economists, Biker and, and Finkelstein. And basically what happened in the state of Oregon, they had a, a, a pretty generous Medicaid program and it ran out of money. They couldn't accept any new patients, any new people into the program because they didn't have the funds. They ended up getting more funds and they opened the program back up and way more people signed up for it than they had money to pay for. So in 2008, they opened a waiting list for its Medicaid program for low-income adults. It had been closed. About 90,000 people signed up for 10,000 openings. What the state of Oregon did in the name of fairness is they randomly chose people off the list list to fill the openings. So from the point of view, now obviously it would be great if everybody who was eligible could get the treatment and all that stuff, but they can't. There's only enough money for 10,000. The fact that they randomized it is like gold for a statistician, right? Because now we have a great comparison group. We have 80,000 eligible people that signed up that didn't have Medicaid and wanted it and were eligible for it, and 10,000 people, right? who were eligible, didn't have Medicaid, wanted it, signed up, and got it. So we can compare health outcomes and, act and actions 
of the people on the waiting list to the people who got in. And those simple comparisons should be causal because there's no selection bias, right? It's not the case that the state let the 10,000 sickest people in, right? That would cause us a problem. If the state let in the 10,000 sickest people or the 10,000 oldest people, right? Or let in 10,000 men and not women, right? All of those things would create selection bias and give us a really hard problem to try to solve. But they let people in randomly, right? So on average, the 10,000 that got in are, you know, identical to the, the 80,000 that didn't because we just randomly chose them. So we don't have selection bias here. We can make very simple comparisons and we can see causally what's the effect of getting Medicaid on behaviors and outcomes. So we can compare the outcomes of people who eventually received access through the lottery against people who applied but didn't win. These researchers published four papers so far examining the impact of Medicaid access on health-related outcomes, medical debt, healthcare utilization, and so on. And some of the results have been surprising and, and somewhat controversial. So let's talk about a couple of them. So one thing that they found was that getting Medicaid allowed, uh, increased the use of healthcare services, more hospitalizations, more emergency room visits, outpatient visits, drug use, and preventative care. Now, a lot of these things are good, right? Preventative care is great. Getting prescriptions that you need is great. One argument for expanding Medicaid had been that uninsured people tend to clog up the emergency rooms, right? That they always go there. And what we see in the study is sort of counterintuitively or surprisingly is that getting access to Medicaid also increased emergency room visits. The second part of this, right, is that there's improved self-reported health outcomes and reduced rates of depression, reported repression, but no significant effect on physical health outcomes. So if you measure like blood pressure you know, of people on and off, things like that. We don't see any difference in these measured health outcomes. So there's kind of something in here for everybody. The pro-Medicaid expansion people are like, well, look, they're getting preventative care. They feel better. They feel happier. And the anti-people are saying they're still, people are still in the emergency rooms. You know, we don't see any measurable effect on, on physical health outcomes. It's not that important, right? So we can't control what people do with these results. And the other thing is, you know, we don't really get at the exact specific mechanism where this happens, right? We're just saying, what's the causal effect on net, no matter all the different complications that may be going on, on net, what's the causal effect of getting access to Medicaid? And our comparison group are the people eligible and wanting to enroll on the list that didn't get in, okay? That randomization of who gets in, defeats selection bias, lets us get clear causal statements. All right. Second example of this, the Vietnam draft lottery. And this work was done by Josh Angrist, one of, one of the Nobel Prize winners. So in the late 60s and 1970s, we were drafting young men to go to Vietnam. We drafted them by their birth dates, right? A certain birth date got a given lottery number. The lower the number, the more likely it is you would be drafted. The army drafted up that list until they fulfilled their manpower requirements. So, you know, we have this example then again, where we have a, not a representative group, you know, young men of military age, but those that go into the army and go to war are selected randomly on birthdays. And those who were eligible for the draft but didn't get drafted were random as well. So again, we have this thing, you know, in the first example, we had people that were eligible for Medicare, which is not a random sample of the population, but the people that got it were randomly selected. Here we have young men of military age, not a random selection or a random slice of the population, but the people that were drafted and had to go to war were randomly chosen out of this control group. So that we can then say, what's the effect of going in the army and going to Vietnam on mental health, earnings, education, whatever. And if we compare them to, you know, people with a, who are the same age and, and things like that, but just had randomly didn't have to go, we can make great comparisons and get causal outcomes. So what Angris did was he combined the birth records of these, of these young men born 50 to 53, who would be of military age in the early seventies, he knows their birthdays, so he knows their draft lottery number. And then he gets income, gets their social security number and gets income from them. And he finds among white men, drafted veterans who went on 
who went to, into the army you know, earned about 15% more lifetime than their peers who avoided the army. So he's finding you know, that the draft is costly, right? That it, you randomly get selected, you go into the army and you serve in Vietnam, it turns out you know, you're, have a lifetime earnings penalty. Right? So findings like this would tend to encourage us to think about you know, paying soldiers and have a volunteer army and realizing that you know, it's just not a couple years out of your life, it has long-term effects on, on earnings and we know other things as well. The great thing about, about this, you know, the great thing, the scientifically efficacious thing about this experiment is of that sample of people that were eligible for the draft, military age, who went and who didn't was decided randomly. Okay, so that's example number two of a natural experiment. I love these things. I could do this all day. I just have a couple more though. So let's let's go ahead and, and talk about them. Okay. The Mario boat lift. If we have some elderly people or some people from Florida, elderly people like me or some people from Florida, they may remember this. This work was done by David Card. Uh, Ronald Reagan challenged Fidel Castro to open up Cuba, let the people go. So Castro did. He loaded up a ton of people on a bunch of, as you can see, rickety old boats and floated them off to Miami. Okay. This is natural experiment for the effects of immigration. Okay, and this is pretty controversial. This was done by David Card. One thing that gets brought up in immigration arguments is that you know immigrants take our jobs, right? They negatively disrupt the economy, make it more difficult for local workers to get good jobs. So Card used this Mario boat lift, where 125,000 Cubans entered into Florida in a very short period of time, right, from April through September. And this increased, made a big increase in the size of, of the Miami's labor force, mainly unskilled labor that jumped by 7% in these few months. So here's a big influx of immigrants into the labor market. Card wants to know, you know, what's the effect of this on the earnings of the natives, native born people. Right. So what Card does is he compares Miami with other cities who are not affected by the Mariel boat lift. I think one of the main cities he uses is Atlanta. And he showed that the arrival of the Mario workers did not notably affect the wages and employment rates of the existing unskilled workers living in Miami. So this big burst of immigration into a very concentrated geographic area did not significantly hurt existing unskilled workers in that area. Again, sort of a controversial finding, but it's a finding we can have some confidence in because we have this natural experiment. Right. The, these workers didn't go to Miami because Miami's labor market was awesome and they knew that and they went to the place with the best labor market. They went to Miami because one, there's other Cubans in Miami and there's a lot of Spanish speakers in Miami. And two, that's the closest place to go to if you're in a, in a leaky old boat from, from Havana, right, is, is Miami. Okay. Follow up just on this a little bit as well. There are later studies using the same idea, the copying card sort of. In 1962, almost a million French Algerians went, Algerians, excuse me, went back to France when Algeria declared independence from France. So that's a huge increase. I mean, France is much bigger than Miami, but 900,000 is a lot of workers in a very short period of time. And then in the collapse of the Soviet Union, about 600,000 Russians moved into Israel, and this was over a few years. Both of these studies find the same thing as CARD, that uh, there are no significant harmful effects on existing workers in these local labor markets. And if we wanna think about why, again, our studies are reduced form studies. They don't tell us why, they tell us what happened causally. They don't tell us why it happened. What economists would tend to say is that these guys, these, these new workers or these immigrants shock labor supply, but they also create demand for stuff too, right? They have to eat, they have to have housing, they might wanna buy clothes. So they create demand for services that stimulate labor markets while they are indeed also increasing the supply of labor. That's one potential explanation for these sort of surprising findings. Let's look at a historical uh, natural experiment. Okay. Call this one extractive institutions. And we're talking about the Spanish colonial rulers of South America back in the 1500s. Okay. This map is of the vice royalty, a uh, part of the vice royalty of Peru back then. It's actually part of the modern country of Bolivia. Potosi down there in the right corner is the biggest silver mine, I think ever perhaps. And the Spanish, as you probably know, when they colonized the new world, that's the main thing they were interested in was silver. They set things up to maximize the ability to extract silver and ship it back to Spain. So 
the map's colors are a relief map. The darker red it gets, the higher it is. The Potosi mine was over 13,000 feet in the air. This is up in the Andes, excuse me. And what the Spanish did was they drew that black ring, irregularly shaped ring around Potosi based on elevation, height. And any village that was inside that ring had to provide forced labor to the Spanish to work in the silver mines. If you were outside that line at a lower, slightly lower elevation, you didn't have to do that. Okay. So Melissa Dell, who will be a future Nobel laureate, I am sure of it. She's already won the John Bates Clark Award, which is an award for the best economist under the age of 40. And I sure she will win the Nobel Prize in, in the future. She's just an excellent economist. What she does is she compares villages just outside the boundary. The, the system was called the Mita, so the Mita boundary, to ones just inside. Okay, So like elevation doesn't change discreetly, right? It's moving smoothly. So if you're at 13,050 feet, you don't look that much different from a village at 13,025 feet, right? On the, I'm sorry, 12,975 feet on the other side of the border. So she's comparing these villages that are separated by this line. Essentially, you know, they're the same. The, the people on one side and the other, are sim, you know, they're, it's the same part of the country. They speak the same language. They have the same customs. They pay the same amount of taxes. They have the same level of, of sort of schooling opportunities. Inside the line, forced labor. Outside the line, not. What she finds is, you know, in the year 2000, like over 200 years later, at villages inside that border are 25% poorer and their children are significantly shorter and skinnier than children just outside that border. The technical term for that is called stunting, right? When, when children don't get enough nutrition and they don't get as large as, as they should relative to a fully nourished child. So this the natural experiment here is like the drawing of that border, right? At, at the border, you know, people on one side are just the same as people on the other side. It's kind of random that you're on, you know, one kilometer inside versus one kilometer outside the border. So we get this natural experiment. They drew the Mita. They didn't draw the Mita because they thought the people inside the border were poor and the people outside the border were likely to be rich. They drew it because of who they thought would be the best workers in the mine. So that's not correlated with what we're going to study, nutrition and incomes. So we don't have selection bias. And we can make a causal statement about the long-term effect of these extractive colonial institutions. It's really a fascinating paper. Just I'm probably not doing it justice. It's really, really good. All right. From the sublime to the ridiculous, let's talk about a natural experiment that I've studied. That's not me in the picture. You could see me, I hope. That's Muammar Gaddafi. And the natural experiment I studied with my co-author, Sam Apsher, is in the Libyan revolution. So we're studying the effect of the access to the internet on political violence. During the revolution, Gaddafi cut off internet and cell service to the rebellious half of the country. There were two, and that makes sense, right? We can't really study that because that's not random, right? He cuts off the internet to his enemies so they can't talk to each other, right? So that it's hard to report any atrocities that the government does, that they can't coordinate to fight against him. There were two networks that served that rebellious part of the country. They cut them off, tried to destroy the equipment, but in one case, the government do, didn't do a very good job of destroying all the equipment. After a month of being blacked out, the rebels were able to reactivate one of the two networks. Right. So what we do is we compare violent protests and violent activity in the reactivated rebellious area to those in the still cut off rebellious area. So we're saying it's just luck that one of these got got reactivated and the other one didn't because incompetence by the government, right, wasn't, wasn't uniformly distributed there. And so, you know, luckily they're able to turn one back on. And what we found that after the one region, rebellious region, got its internet turned back on, compared to the rebellious region that didn't, violence went down, right? The internet significantly reduced violence, which is pretty contrary to a lot of studies in the literature. But we're arguing it's because we have kind of this you know, locally close to random assignment of treatment, you know, and there's nothing in the reactivation that's, you know, that's correlated with violence, you know, that, that this, is, this is kind of a valid effect. So we're really excited about this paper, trying to get in on the act. Hopefully, you know, the Nobel Prize going for this kind of work will help me. We'll see. This is still a work in progress. The last one that I'd like to talk about here before I stop finally talking and take, take questions and stuff 
is probably the clearest, biggest macroeconomic natural experiment that, that, that I can think of, right? And that's the natural experiment of communism versus capitalism in the Korean Peninsula. So this is a map of satellite map of night lights. That's the Korean Peninsula. The southern half is South Korea. You can see that squiggly dividing line there. That's the demilitarized zone, which is highly lit up. The north of that peninsula is North Korea. As it widens out there and gets light again, that's China. The lights there in North Korea around the capital, Punye. So this is an unbelievable natural experiment because before North and South Korea were separate countries before the Korean War, Northern and Southern Korea were very similar to each other. They were very homogeneous. They had the same, you know, uh, cultural background, spoke the same language, had the same religion. If anything, the northern part of the country was richer than the southern part. The Korean War divided the peninsula into two, but the dividing of the peninsula wasn't based on the wealth, right? It wasn't the case the peninsula was divided so the rich people were on the, on the south side and the poor people were on the north side. It was divided just due to the relative strength and political will of the US forces and, and, and the Chinese and North Korean forces, and it didn't really have anything to do with wealth. So that's a great natural experiment where the treatment being capitalist versus being communist is not correlated with the outcome we're trying to study. How rich do you get in the future? Okay. So this is a super clear natural experiment. You know, I'm not here to say that capitalism solves every problem and, you know, that there's, you know, is, is always right or anything like that. But I am trying to say, if you get a choice to live in a communist dictatorship or a capitalist country, I know which one you should, you should probably pick. Right? I know which one I would pick. And this couldn't make it clearer in this one case. So this is a great sort of natural experiment comparing these two, these two different political systems. And again, we're not saying why. We're not saying what is it about capitalism or what is it about the Kim dictatorship that caused this. We're just saying on net, we draw this line from warfare. We put communist dictatorship on the north. We put capitalism in the south. We wait 50 years, what happens? There's the answer. Okay, so if I could just sort of summarize what's going on here. Here's a quote from the two, uh, year 2000 co-Nobel laureate in economics, Daniel McFadden, who's a statistician. And he says, a good way to do econometrics is to look for good natural experiments and use statistical methods that can tidy up the confounding factors that nature has not controlled for us, right? And to a very large degree, that's exactly what Angus Card and Imbens have provided us with. They've given us this option that McFadden says is a good way to do, to do work. So if we want to try to evaluate policies or the effect of certain kinds of treatments, look for the natural experiment and use the relevant statistical methods. Now, you know, we're not, I'm not talking to a bunch of statisticians, thankfully. So I didn't go into statistical methods very much. Card is the main innovator on, on Natural experiments, along with Angrist and Angrist, mostly Imbens, are the innovators on the appropriate uh, statistical methods. But anyway, that's my uh, little talk about the 2021 Nobel Prize. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I really enjoyed putting it together. And I'm super happy, like I said, that these guys won, that causal inference won. It makes me feel really good about the work that I'm doing and what I'm trying to accomplish with my career. So I'll stop here and open everything up for a Q&A. Great. Well, thanks for having me. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for the questions and the, and the interactions. If you're an undergrad student interested in graduate education in economics or political science, the Free Market Institute funds grad students here at Texas Tech. Uh, consider that. You could talk to Professor McGarity or Professor Yuan about that in, in the econ department at, at, at UCA. And just thanks for listening to me. I really enjoyed it and have a good night.